Hello again to everyone. My name is Rinka Stahuliak. I am professor of comparative literature and French here at UCLA and director of the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening on behalf of the center that is now in its 58th year. Um, we are a center that promotes and sustains trans transdisciplinary studies of the period from late antiquity to the early modern era. And since 2019, we also include the spatial coverage of the globe, so beyond the traditional understanding of European late antiquity, Middle Ages and Renaissance, so that we are formally making connections now that are true to the time period from Africa to the Pacific Rim to East Asia. And even though we at the CMRS embrace the globe, we are very mindful of our on-site connections and relationships in these virtual times. We have therefore started a new book salon program uh, aimed at fostering intellectual community by engaging faculty authors about their recently published books. I am very pleased that this year we will feature colleagues who have arrived to UCLA more recently as a way of getting to know them, especially while this in-person exile from each other continues. Our next two book sal salons will take place on March 3rd with Andrea Mudares of Italian, and then on May 19th with Domenico Ingenito of the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department. It seems particularly auspicious that our inaugural new book salon features a conversation around intimacy, an element of our lives that we are sorely reminded of every day in its lack, but also in its potential as we explore other ways of connecting. Our two speakers, Erica Weaver and Danielle Ramine, will first engage in a one-on-one, -on -one, almost intimate discussion, which we will then open up to the audience in the mode of conversation. Please raise your hand, use the raise uh, hand function, or use the chat uh, function to identify yourself so you can ask the question and participate in the conversation. Erica Weaver, is assistant professor of English at UCLA, where she's currently working on a book about the role of distraction in the development of early medieval literature and literary theory, particularly during the 10th century monastic correction movement, traditionally known as the English Benedictine reform. She's also co-editor with Joseph McMullen of the legacy of Boeotius in medieval England, The Consolation and Its Afterlives, published in 2018. Just a note, Erica, you have specialized in intimacy and consolation, very important things in these virtual times, so thank you. Daniel Remain, um, Remain, sorry, is Associate Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where, uh, where he's completing a book about the aesthetics of Beowulf and the poetics of mid-century Bay Area poets, Robin Blaser and Jack Spicer. He is also the author of a collection of poems a treatise on the marvelous for prestigious museums from punctum books and several essays on medieval and comparative poetics. So thank you, Erica. Thank you, Daniel. And please let us be intimate this evening. Thank, well, thank you so much to Srinka and Erin and Brett and Karen, everybody at CMRS. CMRS is one of my absolute favorite things about being here at UCLA. So it's a really nice treat to be talking about the book in this particular space. Um, and especially thank you to everybody who's coming even from other time zones. Um, I think this is one of the nice treats about Zoom is that even though in some ways it's much less intimate, in other ways we're all now having a conversation from within our own living spaces. Um, so it's sort of fitting for this project in particular. Um, and we also wanted to make sure to say a really big thanks to the UCLA Library and in particular to Ginny Steele and to Sharon Farb and the Arcadia Fund for enabling us to publish this book open access. So we're gonna put a link to the project in the chat right now. It is freely available online, anyone can download it. Um, and so we definitely encourage you to take a look there, even if not for us, then for our 13 absolutely fabulous contributors, some of whom are also here um, tonight. So. Thank you. Thank you so much to um, everyone for the support of the book. Yeah, and I'd just like to, to second all of those thanks and, and give a special word of thanks to the CMRS for allowing me to be a part of this um, from the East Coast, the kind of thing that under non-pandemic situations may not have happened. Um, but 
thankfully can happen as, as one little spot of, of odd intimacy uh, in the middle of all of this. So I think we're both very politely deferring to the other person. <laughs> we had a, a planning meeting yesterday um, to discuss. So we have a lot of thoughts and of course we want to hear from everyone else too. Um, but I think maybe where we should begin, Dan, is just talking a little bit about the conceit of the project and where this started. And so I don't know if you wanna say a few words on that to get us going. Yeah, sure. The The conceit of the project is in the title and it's it's a specific kind of joke that maybe only specialists in Old English would get per se, uh, which is that the question of how to date the composition of the poem that, that we call Beowulf has been a, a really problematic and vexed one in Old English studies. It's been traditionally one of the most controversial topics and to the extent that it tends to be a conversation stopping topic, it tends to prohibit work on the poem rather than enable it. Um, there have been a series of volumes on this subject, uh, one from the early 80s titled um, The Dating of Beowulf, and a more recent one called uh, It was The Dating the of da Beowulf, a reassessment. A reassessment. Um, both of which are highly positivist. Well, I've the, they're very different books in a lot of different ways. The second of which is a highly positivist volume and it's really kind of predicated on, um, in a lot of ways, excluding, let's say, theoretical, innovative, um, more capacious modes of scholarship from the study of the poem. Um, and so, you know, to call a book Dating Beowulf with the subtitle Studies in Intimacy uh, is to sort of, I suppose, to troll that effort in a certain way, um, but I hope in a nice, not a mean-spirited way. Um, yeah, and to redeploy this phrase, dating Beowulf, uh, which is something that can that can stop conversation about the poem in a way to, to try to jumpstart it or open it up. I don't know if you want to add some things to that, Erica. Yeah, I think the, the next thing that might be helpful to have in the background of our conversation tonight is that there was only one rule that our 13 contributors had. And I should say they all um, very graciously and energetically committed to this project. They wrote new essays just for the volume. And the one rule that they had to follow that we restricted them with was that they were not allowed to discuss the dating of the composition of the poem. Um, so they could conceive of intimacy in whatever way they liked, either intimacy within the poem or intimacy with the poem and with Old English broadly conceived. Um, so we were very happy with the different modes that they took up. Some of the essays are quite traditional. Some of them are um, much more sort of experimental or using new theoretical methods. Most, all of them though, fuse philological analysis, close reading, translation, this careful attention to the Old English and the historical complexity with new theoretical innovations. So um, we're not, we're really not trying to have any kind of rigid lines between any of these different avenues into the text instead of mostly just opening it up um, and allowing for playfulness and for thinking about what it is we do when we read such an old poem and especially such a canonical poem within Old English studies. Um, I think for most people, if they know anything at all about Old English, this is the only poem that they have encountered, um, certainly the only one that has gotten the blockbuster movie adaptation treatment with Angelina Jolie. Um, and so it has a way of sucking all of the air out of the room. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do with this project was just to invite people to really play with the book um, in a much less serious way, even as it's still a very serious project. Yeah, I, I think Erica, that gets to why, why we have intimacy as a watchword for the book, aside from its, its functionality with respect to the pun of the title, right? <laughs> dating in time and, and going out on a date. Uh, but um, in that, um, in that the, the intimacy as a kind of paradigm for the volume um, also plays against or maybe argues in favor of modes of scholarship that aren't necessarily apologetic for being what a more conservative medieval studies would, would call anachronistic, right? Which is thinking with contemporary theory 
um, thinking with contemporary critical concepts, um, allowing that and the medieval texts to mutually deform each other in interesting ways. Um, and, it, and it militates against positing the poem as a kind of pure objective study. Not that there's no objective relationship to it in a traditional scholarly sense, right? These are scholarly essays with the traditional scholarly apparatus. They're very well researched and highly cited, um, thanks to our really diligent contributors. But it also posits um, some, some other, it, or admits, right, uh, intimacy is one of the, the key trajectories that this scholarship uh, is, is being done on. Yeah, and I know we want to open outward to questions, but just jumping off of that, um, one of the things that we wanted to also note or just pay attention to is that there is this genre within Old English Studies of the Beowulf Handbook. Um, and that's not what this book is trying to be. It's not trying to sum up all of the different approaches to Beowulf. It's not trying to be comprehensive in the different methods that people can bear on the poem or the different readings, um, but it really is meant to just take stock of a certain moment and also open outward other conversations. Um, and one of the things that Dan actually said to me yesterday that I wrote down and put quotes around and want to quote from him now um, is this idea that we're always reading Beowulf in the present moment, even though it's a poem that obviously was written a very long time ago. And you said yesterday, Dan, when we were planning, philology is not a transparent time machine. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a really lovely way of framing a lot of the work that our contributors are doing in that they are paying very careful attention to language and to the love of language. Um, but they're also very aware of the ways in which we're always reading the poem in our present moment, even as we try and get very close to what it was in the past and what it's meant at its various pasts at different points in time. Yeah, my my old English professor, um, Haruko Moma, uh, who is at New York University now, uh, always, she's written a book about the history of philosophy, of philology, I should say, um, about the transformation of philology into English studies. And she will say to almost any class at almost any level, that she'll just remind them of the, the, the oddity of philology as a word etymologically, right? And that it's not a usual ology. It's not biology, subject plus ology, right? It's philia, love plus words, right? Repurposing the logos. It's, 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 a, it's a love of words. And so um, philology is necessarily a trajectory of intimacy. We're not the first people to observe this. A lot of people have theorized philology in a lot of interesting ways. And, and that's not the purpose of the book. Um, although thinking about the, the intimacies of, of scholarly work is one of, the, one of the things that we try to do in the introduction, bringing in some contemporary affect theory, some older deconstruction, um, some work by medievalists that's been done in maybe the past 20 years or so on the subject um, and letting those kind of swirl together um, to, to frame the work by all of our contributors. Should we open? We, we can keep to, going. <laughs> We're happy we to, keep to keep just well, talking we, among ourselves, but we let me invite talk. people to start, um, you know, either raising their hand or um, if, if you prefer uh, putting your name in the chat, uh, if you have a question and, and then we will invite you to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, if you wanna keep going, I do have a question mm. um, for you, but if you wanna keep going for a little longer, um, that's, that's fine. Um, but I'm happy to ask you the question since you were just talking about this. I wanted to ask you about the intimacy of, of doing a co-edited volume. Mm. That's a lovely question. And I don't know if you want to speak to it first or if you want me to start talking. Erica, why don't you start? OK, um, so yeah, we were very aware of that as we were writing. Um, and I think one of the loveliest things about having done this project for me is just having become such good friends with you, Dan. Um, so when we started co-editing 
we knew each other only because we were both early medievalists in the Boston area and we were interested in poetry and poetics and we would see each other at events but we weren't friends and we certainly weren't collaborators or at least not close friends we were friendly in a collegial way um, and so one of the really great pleasures of co-editing has been the friendships that come out of it and I'm one of my other my only other co-editor of a volume of this length Joey McMullen is also here tonight and I really do treasure those collaborative relationships and also the relationships we built with all of our contributors, um, some of whom we knew before the process and some of whom I've still never met in person. Uh, but I feel like I know quite well at this point just from having worked together on this project and on their writing. Um, and so that has been for me really, really lovely. Um, but another thing that I'm very aware of in terms of the contributors and we, I think, you said this, Dan, when we were drafting our acknowledgments, um, and it's a nice way of encapsulating this, that Old English, one of my favorite things about it is it has this dual pronoun, we, we too, for just the two of us. Um, and so it's perhaps fitting to have an Old English volume about intimacy that would be co-edited. And yet it's also quite nice that our we is much more ambiguous in number because any volume is also gonna be a product of a much wider collaboration, um, not only between ourselves or between ourselves and our contributors, um, but also with all of the other people in medieval studies doing amazing work um, and beyond medieval studies, affect theorists um, and theorists working in other fields that have just been really joyful to think with. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's really spot on. And I, you know, I'll say one thing first about the contributors before I forget, uh, which is that it's, interest, it's been an interesting experience as well to, to think about, you know, some of these people are, are folks that I have known for a long time. Um, just looking at the people on the, the Zoom screen that I'm on here um, that are contributors, Mary-Kate Hurley and Peter Buchanan are both people I sort of came up through grad school with, um, although we were all at different institutions. Mary-Kate and I were in New York together studying um, and knew each other quite well and were involved in a lot of the same, you know, things going on around medieval studies as grad students. Um, and then folks that, like Erica said, that I've never met in person, but whose work I'm now really intimate with, whose, whose habits of thought, at least in the instance of this one essay, they may have written another essay where that's totally, totally different, um, that I haven't seen yet, right? But uh, that, yeah, there's that, there's a strange kind of intimacy that maybe has something to say to this, this moment of odd, right, uh, physically distanced intimacies also, um, that kind of correspondence intimacy, I guess, um, which has been a really, actually a really rich experience, right? People in the field like Mary Dockery Miller, who's someone that I've looked up to for a, a long time and whose essays I've read since I was just a, a very baby, baby medievalist, um, right, is suddenly in the volume and an interlocutor. Um, and that is, is also uh, an interesting and, and really, really rewarding experience. Um, on the two of us working together, Erica and I as co-editors, I, I would, the only thing I could think to add would be that it was interesting and, and fun for me. I've co-written an essay before, but nothing on this scale. And it was interesting to see how much working on a project of this scale reveals about the sort of daily quotidian rhythms of lived life as an academic, right? As th that they become visible to you only when you're on the phone with your co-editor who's a few time zones away and you're sort of trying to schedule that phone call just right around the life that you have with like your partner and your work and, and all of those other things. Um, and the contrast of that to when the volume really started, which is that Erica and I bumped into each other at a coffee shop and I had in Somerville, just north of Boston. And I had been thinking about, I had this idea for this book and I didn't know if it was really gonna go anywhere. And I, I wasn't gonna do it if I couldn't get someone to co-edit it with me. And it just sort of, it seemed like Erica might want to do it, and she, and she really did. Um, and you know that moment was was so stood in such contrast. I think the whole time to 
this sort of extended process of um, working this out across across a continent. Right, right. If I hadn't gone to that hipster coffee bar to just, you know, get a really good <laughs> espresso drink, <laughs> this book wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't exist, or at least I wouldn't have been part of it. Maybe it still would have existed in other form. Yes, with someone else he would have bumped into in the coffee shop, right? <laughs> um, Massachusetts... Probably not someone trained in Old English, just... <laughs> That's right, you have the Boston area. There are only so many. We have a few of them here in Boston. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Matthew Fisher. Yeah, uh, Eric and, and, and Dan, I mean, congratulations broadly. Um, I'm struck by, this is like the largest gathering of Old English at UCLA in quite a while, right? As mm -hmm. we do this all virtually. Um, and uh, I'm curious about the way in which intimacy is sort of the, the core jumping off point is also a way of working through some of the limitations of the intimacies of Old English as a field, right? The small intimate nature of Old English studies within the larger arena of medieval studies clearly has both enabling aspects and also deeply complicated aspects. So I was wondering if you might comment on how intimacy both offered a connective tissue for these essays, but also how you were able to sort of push back against some of the prescriptive intimacies of Old English studies by using this as a, as a sort of pivot. Yeah, Erica, do you, or? No, you, I, I went first last okay, time. Okay, there's, well, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think there's a narrative that part of Old English studies has told itself for a long time that, and different parts of it, that says that Old English studies has been, say, behind on engaging with critical theory or behind on, as if it was still 1995 or something right now, um, when we tell ourselves, right, that sort of thing. And this is heard both from people like me who are trained really heavily in what we call or still call or used to call theory with a capital T, and people who are really dedicated to just sort of traditional philological paleographical methods and, and people in between. And we tell it to ourselves for different reasons, right? Um, some people to say like, oh, this field's so behind to complain about it. And others to be like, thank goodness we don't, we don't do that. Um, but the truth is that it's, it's both, right? There are parts of the field that resist it. There are parts of the field that for a long time have been really, really invested in trying new things, doing things that are odd, that are not intimate with the traditional modes of the field. Um, and so I think the book is trying and intimacy allows us to pick up on both of those. So we have an essay like, um, because his face is on the screen in front of me, Peter Buchanan's essay, which takes up a novel um, by Breyer, who um, in, in an early 20th century modernist, um, a novel that is called Beowulf, but on first glance has nothing to do with the poem at all, and puts it into um, a queer historiographical conversation with the poem itself. And that's something that's not a very intimate thing, maybe to a lot of Old English studies, um, and maybe wouldn't be seen as a very traditional, you know, whatever. Then we have essays that are just like really great work on, um, affect theory that proceed via careful philological analysis or Mary Kate's essay, which works on um, actor network theory or the assumptions of actor network theory, and then proceeds to do really careful philological work. Um, so it, it also allows, I think, for an intimacy of different modes of, of critical work. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I would say too that's maybe one of the great ironies of this project is that it was responding to another volume about the dating of Beowulf, and at least that was its genesis, which was um, really insistent about the kinds of methods that could and could not be born on Old English texts. Um, that Old English, the reading of Old English has to prioritize um, certain kinds of reading. Um, and I'm not saying that they're not important. I think they're hugely valuable. And I treasure a lot of the, the work that's done in more traditional fields. Um, but I think one of the great ironies is that then with our volume, 
trying to open conversations, we then sort of opened, we kicked another hornet's nest that we weren't expecting to and got pushed back for entirely different reasons because of the way that we were doing theory or the way that we were framing the conversation. And so I think sometimes um, even kind of theoretical medievalism can also be very rigid about the ways in which it's able to be practiced. Um, and I think that's just as destructive. Thank you. We have a question from Mary Dorcre Miller. I will read it out. It says, uh, intimacy tends to be coded as feminine, but Beowulf and philology tend to be coded as masculine. Can Eric and Dan think out aloud a bit about this contrast? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like with many of your observations, Mary, it's really, really apt. Um, and uh, one of the things that I also want to say, and I don't want to bash the other volume, because again, I think one of the things that we were very committed to doing in this project was responding to it, um, but not not in a negative way or also not trying to foreclose any conversation about it. Um, I think the other volumes or the conversations about the dating and the composition, those have also done important things in the field. And um, one of the things though that we were committed to responding to was the fact that that essay had only one female contributor. And this is a field that has over half women and has for a very long time. Um, and so in terms of philology being coded as masculine, I do think that's very true. And then oftentimes even the rejection of theory within Old English studies has broken down along very gendered lines. Um, not only in the rejection of very pioneering early feminist criticism, in Old English studies, um, but also moving forward into other theoretical modes, there often seems to be the idea that these are weaker ways of reading um, and oftentimes these are meretricious. Uh, I have seen it said in ways that are very explicitly and very uncomfortably gendered and anti-feminist. Um, so one of the things that we were committed to doing was centering feminist work on the poem um, and also queer theory and queer work on the poem. Yeah, and I, I think it is worth noting that um, that work on intimacy or the, the extent to which intimacy or theoretical work might be coded as feminine in the field. Um, I, I don't know how much, I don't know what the, the numbers are on this, but I would say that those of us that have done theoretical work in the field owe a great debt to, as Erica suggested, pioneering women who were doing theoretical work uh, in the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, I have, I just, I'm here at my little workstation. So I have a copy of Jillian Overing's Language, Sign and Gender in Beowulf right here, um, which was an early work, I wanna say nine, 1990, right? That's doing that and taking up deconstruction and um, semiotics and, gender theory um, early on in the field, very, very early on in the field. Um, in our own book, it, you know, Mary Dockery Miller, who asked this question, ha her essay, which is the, the last in the, in the book um, for on, kind of on purpose, um, not because it's the least meretricious, but because it, it says something very important about um, emotional connections and the performance of masculinity and the poem performing a, an, a really interesting shift uh, in how it configures the relationship between intimacy and the emotional dimension of human relationships and its relationship to masculinity um, as Beowulf is dying at the end of the poem and his young retainer Wiglaf is, is trying to, to help him really. Um, I don't know, those are some things that come to mind. Uh, it's, I, as I sit here, every example of work that I can think of sort of off the cuff um, is by women, which doesn't mean that there aren't men that are working on, on the subject um, or that it should be coded a particular way. It's just, I don't know. We were asked to think out loud and I hope we've done it. Right, no, always dangerous. It's, it's an intimate encounter though, Dan, this is a safe space. Um, Kirsty Francis uh, has a question. Yeah, I 
this is kind of a follow up to what Erica was just speaking about in her thinking out loud. Um, you were talking about how you wanted to make sure to center um, more women's voices and queer theory. And I was wondering if you guys could talk like practically because this is something I'm interested in um, on how you guys went about like finding contributors and making sure that you had a good balance of contributors and like how the essays fit together and things like that. If you could talk a bit about the practicalities of co-editing and really putting all the great essays together. Thank you so much. Yeah, I. so that is such a hard question. And one of the things that I think both of us would say is um, there are certainly things about the volume where obviously we wish that we could have um, included more voices. And um, it's always hard to have a set contributor list. And especially it's always hard to get people to agree to a project for an edited collection with two very junior editors, one of whom I was in graduate school at the time, and uh, on a new topic. So they don't have essays to draw on. They have to actually commit to writing something for this project and then trusting the two of us to actually package it up and then make it exist in the world. Um, especially because several of our contributors were pre-tenure, they were on the job market, uh, they, they really needed these essays to appear for various reasons. Um, and so, we're grateful to them, <laughs> you know. Certainly, um, a lot of people just told us no, and we understood that. Um, not all of our invitations were unfortunately accepted, um, but we are very grateful to everyone who joined us in this sort of mad experiment um, and who trusted that we really would shepherd their essays through and we really would make this book exist in a timely fashion. Um, and so we are glad for that. Um, but we also, we were talking yesterday about how we, again, in the vein of this not being a kind of traditional Beowulf handbook, um, we also don't, I, I don't think that there's any quota on how much work can exist in the world. And I always want to see new work. And I think the, the most exciting thing for me would be if people would take these essays, especially they're all in the creative commons, people can do whatever they want with them, as long as it's true to the scholars, you know, intention. Um, and to make new work and to keep fostering new collections and to keep opening more conversations outward. Yeah, I mean, I think I was, I was barely an assistant professor when I, when, when we started this and Erica was still a graduate student and being in that position and trying to solicit work made it infinitely more complex than I thought it would be when I first, when we thought, let's do this. Um, and that is one factor among many in why, you know, the book doesn't attain the level of inclusiveness that we really want it to, right? Um, and that's, you know, it's how it is in a, in a way that the book does represent in a lot of ways, a snapshot of the field at a particular moment. Um, and in some ways it doesn't, there are parts, aspects of the field that it's not pushing forward mm -hmm. as much as it could for sure. Um, because it's not going to escape sort of the, the abs the, what the reality of the field is at a given moment when you're a junior scholar you're not necessarily in, in, in position to change the entire institution. Um, but yeah, I mean, having, having a co-editor also makes soliciting essays easier, <laughs> I think. It's another, it's another thing that I think uh, speaks well of, of collaborating when a volume is being put together. Thank you. Yes, there would be the additional question to that, why you chose not to write, but I will, the two of you, why you just chose to co-edit, which is an interesting thing to- We did to, write, we co-edited. You did, I didn't see it, I'm so sorry. You wrote the, you wrote the introduction, but you, you yourselves did not write a, um, a separate essay. That, that's you true. Did. I'm not sorry. I apologize. No, 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 no. no it's, a, it's a very fair point. So we, we co-authored the introduction always thinking that it would be a full freestanding essay on its own. Um, and so that it would be doing more than just a traditional kind of rundown of what was coming ahead in the chapters. Um, but we decided not to contribute our own separate essays, mainly just because we didn't want to take out the space. <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't want to take all the oxygen in the project. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that our contributors, especially because 
we had 13 of them. Um, the volume already was way over length when our first draft came together. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that if we had to cut words, then we would be cutting ourselves. We wouldn't be cutting from our contributors. Um, although some of our contributors, uh, as they may remember, they did get some hefty cuts. <laughs> But, and then again, um, and this maybe anticipates Becky's question about the open access format, um, is that in order to keep everyone's contributions at the length that we wanted, and even with having to make them whittled down, um, we did have to get a subvention for the book. And so it just turned out that in doing that, we were also able to get this open access funding and therefore to make the book freely available. Um, which we also wanted because then it makes it more available for classrooms, it makes it accessible for anybody who's curious about this poem, um, and not, not just for academics. And we really did ask all of our contributors to you know, write stylishly, write accessibly, write in a way that somebody could read your essay, even if they don't know anything about the critical conversations in this poem, really invite people in um, and make it a project that anybody could respond to or be a part of. So we have uh, quite a few more questions now lined up. So um, first uh, from Georgia Henley, uh, I was struck by what you said at the beginning about the importance of interpretation in the present moment, which brought to mind the recently published translation of Beowulf by Mar Maria Dawana Headley. I wonder if you could say a few words about how you see intimacy working in the practice of translation and in that translation in particular. Erica, have you read all of that yet? I haven't gotten through it. I Yeah, I taught it this quarter, actually, which is the perks of being on the quarter system is that we started late enough that it had just come out in September and I was able to <laughs> already get it on my syllabus. Um, so yeah, I can respond to that. I think that's a really great question. And I do think translation is one of the threads that stitches together all of the essays in the volume and the intimacy of translation and the reminder whenever you're going back to Old English, whenever you're sort of returning to the same lines again and again, even if they're lines that you think you know perfectly well and you think are very transparent that are very easy to translate, um, that there's always a sense of mediation that's happening as you're then framing them in your own language. Um, and so I do, I do think that's an important theme for the contributors. In terms of the Headley translation, I'll be honest, I have very, I have very mixed feelings about it. Um, so I, I really like her introduction. In some ways, I think it's an interesting project. I'm always really excited to see new Beowulfs, especially new versions of Beowulf that can make it into the New York Times. Um, but if anybody is curious for more about this, Irina Dumitrescu has just written a really, really smart review of it that basically perfectly encapsulates a lot of the thoughts I had when I was reading it. Um, just that there are some things I think Headley gets really, really right, and there's some beautiful moments in it. And then there are some other aspects of it that I find deeply frustrating and actually flattening to some of the complexities of the poem. Um, on, I, not having read the translation, I won't speak to the translation itself, um, but I'll, I'll mention that our, we have an essay by David Hedbonic in the book, um, on translation as a mode of intimacy and thinking about sort of comparing Beowulf translations as different kinds of intimacy rather than sort of aligning them on a scale of more or less faithful, more or less creative, right? And that being, that's kind of the traditional way um, that those things have been sort of measured. Um, and so, and that's a that's a really great essay. I'd recommend it. He talks about um, Seamus Haney's still really, I guess we could say canonical translation in a, in a, in a way. It has its own noun, it's definitely. <laughs> yeah, right, it has it has Haney Wolf status. Um, it's not going anywhere uh, and, and it has its virtues. And um, Thomas Meyer's translation, um, which uh, is a very different translation. It's a, it's, it's a piece of modernist experimentation throughout. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a really interesting, I'd, I'd stand behind David's essay. Uh, I'd recommend anyone interested in that, take a look at it. Um, it would be an interesting read for people interested in translation or translation theory, apart from Beowulf as well, I think. Um, but it also reminds me of 
the way that translations of Beowulf work in terms of intimacy on another scale, which is that, you know, David's essay talks about Meyer's translation, um, which was one that sat in a drawer for like 40 years before it was published by a small publisher. Um, Headley's translation is one that's come out with a major press to international acclaim immediately, right? So there are these scales at which, at which translations are read as well. They're sort of not as a reflection of quality, but major or minor translations in terms of market, right? Um, and that they're, the relationship of these things to markets uh, also does inflect, I think, how intimate one might feel with the poem in, in reading it. Yes, thank you. Intimate is not necessarily faithful, right? But maybe faithful shouldn't be our main criterion um, or the only criterion. So, um, Dennis Nelson. Um, great. Hi. Uh, this is so, so wonderful. And I, I apologize, I'm a bit of an interloper here as a contemporary poetry scholar. But I do think this is uh, the kind of project that, that brought me, you know, brings my interest. And um, I will say also on, on the fact of writing. I got the opportunity to teach the essay, uh, Getting Intimate, co-written by, uh, co by Erica and Dan to the pro seminar. And it was, I think, without doubt, the most engaged, committed conversation that this pro seminar of students across historical periods had throughout the quarter, which I think really speaks to the, the quality of the, the writing and the quality of the argument, um, which leads me to this question, which is about like intimacy of like trans historicism or something about, like, I think this comes back to like, you know, seeing Thomas Meyer pop up in your essay, um, or for me, the, the moment you guys talk about um, Spicer and Blazer and their like queer intimacy in translating Beowulf together, right? And I think that there's a kind of queer temporality there or queer futurity that seems like inherent to dating Beowulf, right? Like you're always having to cross time in some, in some, some queer ways. And I, I think that the way you all outlined that was really, really quite beautiful. I'd love to hear more. Um, I, I did want to point to one more experimental translation, um, mostly because uh, Matthew Fisher was prodding me in private chat, uh, called Keith Wolf um, by Wilmer Wilson IV. I'll just plug this, um, uh, who has uh, translated all of Beowulf through the lyrics of Chief Keith, um, the, the drill artist from Chicago, uh, which is perfect because the hip hop vernacular is all about like boasting, uh, right, about the, the strength of your crew. It's about like uh, articulating your lineage and where you come from. Um, and about like bonds of, of really homosocial uh, intimacy, uh, which I think come out so much in, in the text. So I guess uh, I want to ask the question about how this applies in a kind of trans historical way into the present and, and how much that was on your minds in, in both articulating the collection and in writing the, the introduction that you guys wrote. Thank you for that question. It's really lovely. I'm, I'm so flattered to hear uh, about the reception of the essay in among graduate students from not just uh, medieval studies. That's really, really um, rewarding to hear. Um, for me, those questions are at the heart of, you know, 90% of what I do as a medievalist. Um, my work has been from the moment I was in grad school really about moving between 20th century poetics and medieval poetics and trying to understand how to do that and what it means to do that and what happens when 20th century poets did that. Um, and, and there's a kind of direct line, right? Like Spicer and, and Blazer both studied Beowulf with uh, a guy named Arthur Bordeaux, who was a major, he wrote a book called The Art of Beowulf that came out uh, about a decade after they took his Beowulf seminar at Berkeley uh, in the late 40s. And they both, for his class, produced you know, student study translations of the poem, um, which I've written about, and David Hedbonik, who's in the book, has written about. Uh, and then also what happens when there isn't that kind of positive connection between poet A and medieval text B, but there's a different kind of intimacy, right? One that isn't necessarily identifiable through reference or illusion or, or direct engagement, um, but those texts speak to each other. Um, often in the ways, you know, most conventionally, I think in the way that we think of comparative, comparative literature in, in the old sense of that, um, but uh, across a, di a diachronic axis. axis. Um, on the other hand, 
there's this other element to that that's ne that's never so simple or conventional. I think that you gesture to really well in talking about the moment. There's a moment in our introduction talking about Blazer and Spicer working on their translations of Beowulf. Um, I can't remember if it's four or five nights a week. And then one night they can go out to the Red Lizard and they add, that's a queer bar, right? Just so you know, this is in, in a conversation that Robin Blazer had later on in his life. Um, as if to like really put Beowulf and the queer community to really imbricate the two together, right? This work of translating is, is the same fabric of their life as like going out to, to the gay bar on Friday night. Um, and, and yeah, so there is, there's something that's never so sort of straight time, straight temporality uh, about doing that. It's never just comparative work. Um, and then hopefully I think a lot of our essays try to get it all the different ways that it can be doing that, right? Like I think queer theory gives us a great language for it, um, but there are other languages for it as well. I just want to add to that, and this is really non-substantive, so I apologize, but it's just taking all of my restraint to not follow that Keef link. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yes. It was not on my radar at all, and I'm very excited to take a look at that. Um, and I also just want to say thank you again for the invitation to come to the Pro Seminar. It was really, really delightful, um, as is this event with CMRS. It's just been very fun for us to get a chance to talk about this book. Um, and yeah, in terms of crossing period lines, I feel like even though my own book project, um, certainly that I'm working on now, is much more conventionally historicist, I'm always crossing period lines because, of course, I'm always reading in the present moment. And I think that's true for this project as well, um, is that it's very, it was very obvious when we were talking about Blazer and Spicer or even crossing the Atlantic to then think about Edwin Morgan and Scotland and isolation uh, for him and reading Beowulf and while living in the closet. Um, but even at the other moments in the poem, I think we're very aware. And there's a, another moment at the beginning of the essay um, where we think about the position of the reader of Beowulf as being most like Grendel. And that's because we're always in the position of being able to hear the music, but never actually getting into the party ourselves, right? We can hear these distant echoes in the past or we can read the text, but we're not really there. We can only ever get so close. Um, and I do think that's something that I always try to remember in any medieval text that I'm reading is that we always have to be careful about remembering its particularity, even as we try and bring it closer to ourselves. Thank you. Raphael Burns. Hi. Um, well, thanks for, thanks for presenting this book. I had a little question. This is kind of a linguistic, um, playful question, maybe a form of philology there. Um, which since formulating the question, I realized looking um, at uh, the book that possibly the first contribution to the volume actually <laughs> is precisely on this. But um, something I've always loved about the term intimacy is how it, uh, in, it also, it evokes at once a something making internal, something um, close and, um, um, well, yeah, intimate, but also the, the, the verbal form to intimate, right, which is about signifying and making known. And already just, I mean, the, the fact that you're, this is an open access publication, I think is lovely in the sense that it's about intimacy, but it's also um, sort of signifying outwards to the broadest possible public. But I was wondering if you could um, elaborate more on how, how you formulated your, um, or sort of the discussions you had around uh, the term intimacy and especially in that sort of tension between uh, inward and outward. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And as you say, the first essay in the volume by Ben Saltzman actually begins with that pairing. And so he pulls in the sort of modern dictionary definition. Uh, and then he talks about how these two senses, the kind of interior intimacy and then the externally directed verb to intimate, actually converge in Beowulf scenes of shared storytelling. And so he's talking about these moments where they come together and where communities are able to form, but then also are very quickly ruptured. Um, so I would definitely point everyone to his essay. But the other thing that I would say is that uh, we were 
excited to begin the volume with his essay because it does have that very nice playfulness of thinking about the word itself. But then we were also a little bit hesitant as we kept moving the essays around and figuring out what combinations worked best because we also didn't want to insist on any one definition. Um, so my favorite thing about Ben and about your really lovely question is just the slipperiness of even the word intimacy always meaning several different things at once um, and sometimes requiring very careful parsing to figure out which it is in any given instance. Yeah, and I would say that Ben's essay is also really one of its virtues is also really following out the logic of intimacies through the way they've been taken up in, you know, deconstruction and more contemporary theory um, to think about the relationship between intimacy and community and the particularly, you know, toxic potential of both, right? The the forming of the forming of the bubble right that that it produces the the sort of immunization against a dangerous outside that can be inherent in community intimacies that can function to right police people out of the field or or whatever um and again you know this returns us to to the figure and he takes this up in his essay of grendel um excluded from the the sort of music and joy and gift giving that goes on inside the hall in Beowulf, um, sort of lurking out in the darkness. Um, and yeah, and then he turns it towards the field too at the end to ask, is, is intimacy always premised on some form of exclusion? Um, which, I, which I also think is just an important thing to sit with. And, and there is a question in the queue that kind of gestures towards that, but it is the last question in our queue. I'm not, I don't want to skip over those who have been waiting. So maybe I'll just read it as a, as a note um, to what you've been saying. And then we'll go back to uh, the questions in order. Mary Kate Hurtley who comments, I don't know if we'll have time, but I know that one thing that keeps coming up obliquely is the idea of genealogy, who started with whom and who has affected uh, their work of poetry, et cetera. Right. So in the ways in which, yes, the, 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 the fields are formed or currents are formed or movements are formed, but also the ways in which then this excludes others. Right. So this is this is really um, uh, an important question. But I want to turn to um, Audrey Walton, who also wrote her question in the chat. Um, she's next. I'm really interested in some of the ways you've mentioned that this volume manages to resist or transcend binaries. I'm thinking here of approaches like playfulness, even trawling adaptations and anachronism. I wonder what you think about the future of this kind of work. How, how can we continue to move beyond these binaries, especially where they are unhelpful? Do you think approaches like these could eventually become a larger part of the mainstream of early medieval studies? I, I, I think maybe in short, yes, but we weren't, we have by far not been the first to do this sort of thing, right? Um, you know, there's, the, the idea has been there um, for a long time, um, but, you know, work is, I guess, as early as, and earlier probably, but I'm thinking of Carolyn Dinshaw's 1999 book um, on, uh, someone help me with the title, Getting Medieval. How, how do you forget that title? Um, Sexualities and Communities Pre and Postmodern, right? Um, which is arguing that there, there, one of the things it argues in its introduction really memorably is that there has to be a way between complete mimetic identification with the past and then the absolute alteritism of positing it, right? As an absolutely other object of study. Um, and she posits what she calls a queer touch, which is a kind of a partial, identificatory touch or a fragmentary touch with the past. And a lot of scholars have taken up um, that as a possibility since then, um, you know, where the, also one's sort of cathexis with the past and with their objects of study is not sort of excluded from the, from the analysis, um, but neither is it, you know, sort of pure unreflective performance either. There's there's some sort of, so sort of a dialectic between those things. I, I think it works with intimacy because it allows a kind of dialectical movement maybe between these poles of say like scholarship and play or 
invitation and trolling or, or whatever. And I think it's also something that's present in a lot of early medieval texts, right? Mm. This sense of absolute playfulness, even for very serious theological disputations or very meditative material, but taking shape in um, very fun or unexpected ways. Um, so I, I think that it's there in the past and I hope that it'll also be here with us and continue into the future. Um, one thing that I just wanted to say and uh, I don't want to put him in the spot, but just responding to Mary Kate's question, um, I just wanted to highlight you know, my my doctoral advisor Dan Donahue is here with us tonight. Um, and one thing that I just wanted to say to thank him um, is that in some ways I think our work is very similar, but in a lot of ways our work is very very different. And uh, so I think genealogies are complicated, um, and that I'm absolutely very proudly a Dan Donahue student, um, but I also I'm think we're doing different things in different ways. And um, I've always felt incredibly supported in that. So thank you. Thank you so much to Dan. Um, and I hope you're not <laughs> embarrassed by me putting you on the spot, but I, but I did want to say that. And the last question goes to Domenico in genital. Oh, what a burden. <laughs> last question, sorry. I'll try to be very brief. Thank you so much for for also for sharing the, the link. And I didn't know that the book is available in open access. This is so exciting. Um, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really fascinated by the way that you seem to uh, approach the problem of the, uh, of the false dichotomy between philology and theory. Mm -hmm. And especially because I come from an extremely conservative uh, field, which is uh, medieval Persian poetry. And I'm interested in the way that in quite an orientalist way, right? In our own field, we look uh, at what you guys do in Western philological fields as a source of validation for you know, how far we can go. We, we, so it's interesting how in the, in the field of, 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 especially medieval Persian, a bit less than that in, uh, in, uh, in the Arab, in Arabic literature, uh, and much less in modern, early modern Persian or Arabic. So this is interesting. And I'm 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 just wanted to you know ask whether you ever think about the uh, connections between different fields, so other literary heritages and the way that your own approach to this sort of problematic connection between philology and theory is informed by your curiosity or interest in other fields and how you also are willing to address also other other fields with your own work? How, so how do you see the, within, within the medieval style, within the sort of broader, broader global Middle Ages, uh, how, do, how do you see the, the connections with other fields and how this, this issue of, of, of theology and, 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 and theory also can, can be one of the main axes of, of your exploration of such connections? Yeah, they, and that is such a fascinating, question do you have i mean that's in or do you want me to jump in yeah i mean i'll just i think that the late the study of the later middle ages in medieval europe has done a better job of this so far than old english studies has as a field i think we can start with that um, which isn't to say that old english studies hasn't engaged in global thinking but um it truly has um and how you know transmission has moved around but i think it's it's been traditionally a very small field um, that's been traditionally, I'll say again, this isn't, there are exceptions, more reticent um, to learning from other fields. But, um, you know, there are some things to do here that could, that could be really interesting. Um, I, you know, once I gave a talk and there was, a scholar of medieval Arabic poetry there, which is whose name is escaping me, right? And I can't, I can't read any non-Indo-European languages, right, or anything. Um, but out of all the conversations I had there, that was definitely the most. It sticks with me, right? I, he he gave me vocabulary that I'm still using to think about the way that. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into it, but. Um, there was sort of technical philological vocabulary that was useful for me. So I, I feel like. The answer to your question is like, I haven't done it much, but I should more. 
I guess, for me. Yeah, me too. I think that the impulse that I see people doing a lot in Old English studies, and which I think we do in this book too, is that um, we have a habit of looking outside of the field and especially to the contemporary whenever we want new paradigms for things. And then we always try and kind of play them backwards and say, you know, medieval studies can be part of these conversations too, or, you know, really all theory is just medievalism. And uh, we need to just look backwards to pre-modernity to map these lineages for the postmodern. Um, and I'm not discounting that work. I think a lot of it has been very interesting. It's been very generative. Um, but then I also do think that sometimes we really need to be talking to other medievalists. Um, and again, I think that's one of the things that's really lovely about CMRS and especially about the reading group that Matthew Fisher has been coordinating this quarter um, and where Domenico I've gotten to know you just a little bit just in um, having everyone coming together from different fields and reading primary texts and thinking through them together from our different positionalities in literature or history or art history um, and especially in many different literatures but I also think to echo what Dan was saying there's a real impulse within Old English to always look towards Middle English um, and to always sort of jealously or longingly look towards them and say, oh, you know, they're so big and powerful and they get so many tenure lines and they have so many resources and here we are with nothing in this tiny little disappearing field. Um, and partially that's just accurate, but it's also really destructive. Um, and I think we oftentimes insist on having this rigid line, even though we'll try and trouble it. We'll say, oh, people are still reading Old English into the 12th century, and they're still copying homilies. And um, so there is, of course, crossover, and scholars are aware of that. And yet, whenever we break things down, it's always, I am an early medievalist, and I do Old English. Um, and I can't talk to those people who are doing Middle English, because that's something very different. Um, and I do think that crossing more of those lines, not only across periods, but also across um, geographic boundaries, is definitely going to be very productive moving forward. Um, and, and it sounds like medieval Persian and Old English have a lot in common. <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to talk to you yes. more. Yes, well, thank you, everyone. This has been a great conclusion. Thank you, Domenico, for this last question. This has been a great conclusion because it really wraps up uh, so well what we've been trying to do at CMRS um, uh, recently and, and this sort of the, embra the embrace of the globe. So um, I think many years ago, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Erica, this idea that taking in contemporary paradigms to think about our periods uh, is, is always sort of, posi we're positioning ourselves as, we wanna participate in this conversation, please listen to us. And many years ago, I did a conference back when I was in Boston myself at Boston University, a conference that was called Theory from the Middle Ages. Wow. And so I think maybe what Domenico is suggesting in this conversation as we embrace the globe, um, as we talk to each other among medievalists, um, that there will be paradigms that we will be able to come up that, that will be uh, sent forward into the contemporary rather than um, the other way around. But um, thank you, Wei, uh, again, uh, for, for letting us into uh, your intimate world of co-editing co this volume and um, a different world of Beowulf uh, that some of us know only superficially, me among them. And um, again, have a good evening. Thank you for coming. And please come to our next events.